Good day, everyone. That's right. It is the weekend. And now that means you get to see the weekly recap of all the top stories conveniently located in one location. That's right. You are welcome. Enjoy it. Have a wonderful weekend and we'll see you on Monday. Now, an Oklahoma man who has been convicted of first degree murder and had been sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole has now had his conviction overturned and been awarded a new trial because wait for it. That's right. One of the prosecutors handling his case and the judge presiding over his case had engaged in an undisclosed sexual relationship. Yes, you cannot do that, ladies and gentlemen. That is unethical. You can't do that. So Robert Leon Hashigan, who earlier that year had been convicted of murdering his 94-year-old neighbor, a woman by the name of Evelyn Goodall, back in 2013, has now had his conviction overturned. His attorney had learned that Tim Henderson, the former Oklahoma County judge who presided over Hash. Higgins trial had an affair with one of the three prosecutors assigned to the defendant's case. Now, Judge Henderson and the assistant district attorney identified only as KC had previously undisclosed sexual relationship beginning back in 2016 and 2018. It is no exaggeration to state that the very integrity of the judiciary in Oklahoma is at stake here, his attorney wrote regarding the appeal, quote, if a man can be convicted and sentenced to die in prison at a trial before a judge and a prosecutor who were literally in bed together, then no citizen of Oklahoma can or should expect to get a fair trial in any Oklahoma court, end quote. The Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals voted three to two to overturn Hash Hagen's conviction and order a new trial. I want to know what the other two that said he wasn't entitled to a new trial based upon the judge and the prosecutor having an affair. Are you kidding me? Needless to say, the defendant is now presumed innocent once again, and he gets to start his journey all over again, as his attorney noted. Now, though the defense team gave six reasons why the conviction should have been overturned, the appellate judges appear to have uh, been most concerned by one argument in particular that Hash Hagen had been denied the right to a fair trial. The court noted that he had been deprived of a fundamentally fair trial of his guilt or innocence because he was tried before a judge who should have been disqualified from presiding over the case due to a previously undisclosed sexual relationship between the judge and one of the prosecutors, the court noted. Now, the assistant district attorney, identified only as KC, was not merely present at Hash Hagen's trial. According to people that were there, she cross-examined multiple defense witnesses and even gave the prosecution's closing argument. And quote, we both firmly believe that we were treated extremely unfairly at trial, said the attorney who worked on defending Hash Hagen. At the time, they didn't know why. Well, I think we have a better idea now, now don't we? Can you imagine, ladies and gentlemen, the judge, the judge sleeping with the prosecutor. Leave me a comment below. Does anybody think that it, that would be okay for the judge to be dating the prosecutor? Oh no, oh no. This is why judges have to recuse themselves. And we had a case similar to this a while back, I'd probably been 10 years, where there was a magistrate judge. And guess what? He and a prosecutor were going back to his chambers in between, you know, cases and having a relationship. And it didn't come out until later when somebody found out. And guess what? All of those cases that that prosecutor and judge were before all had to basically begin anew. The judge ultimately got disbarred because he didn't even respond to the disciplinary proceedings against him. Who knows what he's doing these days, but you just don't do it. See, once again, ladies and gentlemen, you see why I don't get too excited by people in position of authority. I'm not starstruck by really anyone. Um, I've seen judges make big mistakes. I've seen politicians make big mistakes. I've seen people with tons of money 
make big mistakes. That's just the way it is. So just remember, ladies and gentlemen, look at people for what they're doing at that particular time, not the position they hold. It really doesn't give them any more respect than, well, frankly, that they have to earn every single day. Well, needless to say, um, Hash Hagen's attorney, they'll try to resolve this via some sort of plea agreement. If not, they are prepared to go to trial. And needless to say, Judge Henderson will not be the one behind the uh, bench for this trial. The former judge resigned after Hash Hagen's conviction after three other female attorneys had accused him of sexual misconduct. However, Henderson was never charged with any crime because he was a judge. I mean, I mean, because they couldn't find enough evidence to support the allegation. Judge Henderson argued that the sexual relationships he has had with female attorneys had been consensual and he had always ruled fairly from the bench. He said, quote, my rulings were fair and supported by the evidence and facts presented by the attorneys. He claimed that as his disciplinary hearing back in November. Despite his claims, some now fear that uh, many other convictions will be overturned on account of Henderson's alleged inappropriate behavior. Obviously, there were hundreds, if not thousands of people that appeared before the Judge Henderson that did not know he had had a relationship with the DA's office. I'm not sure it's going to go all the way to every case, but at least the one where his girlfriends were before him. That should have been disclosed to all parties. Why would a judge think he could do that? Just arrogance. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, just arrogance. The prosecutors in the Brian Koberger matter, well, they think the judge is creating air and they want him to fix it. What do I mean? What am I talking about? Well, as you may recall, back on July 10th, the court issued an order based upon the defense's motion to stay the proceedings. The defense wanted to challenge the indictment in its of itself, but they hadn't received any of the documents necessary to do that. The transcripts weren't done. The court said, hey, I get it. You have a right to challenge the uh, grand jury proceedings, but you haven't given me anything where I can actually issue this stay that's supposed to go into place uh, when that takes place because you haven't been given the transcripts to do anything. So the judge said it's premature, but I'm going to toll speedy trial, which means stop the clicking of the speedy trial clock for 37 days. Well, now the prosecutors say, hey, judge, you can't do that, and you're creating potential error. So, like I said, the prosecution requests that the court reconsider their order staying speedy trial in the Brian Koberger matter, and they allege that the law does not allow the defendant to partially waive his statutory right to speedy trial, and thus his acquiescence to the limited stay should be deemed to be a full waiver of speedy trial. Now, this obviously creates a, a bunch of litigation in the future if the court doesn't get this right. As you recall, in Idaho, the defendant has six months from the date that he says not guilty for his trial to take place. If they get him to trial within six months and a day, the case gets dismissed. So if the court doesn't have the authority to waive speedy trial or the defendant doesn't unequivocally waive speedy trial on the record and the court is operating under like, well, we got at least another 37 days. Don't worry about it. And he doesn't. Guess what? Brian Koberger could walk free. Now, I don't think the court's going to let that happen, but that is one of the draconian uh, consequences that, in fact, could take place. So the prosecutors go on and they note that um, the uh, court stay has no practical effect where the parties are continuing to litigate discovery matters and file motions. And there's a trial setting and the defendant is free to request a stay in the future due to these uh, practical considerations. And the state says that the court needs to rescind the order staying that time for speedy trial. Now, the state further requests that the jury trial in this matter remain set for October 2nd of 2023, or alternatively, that it be moved beyond the speedy trial period only if the defendant unambiguously waives his right to a speedy trial. And the state makes this request to give to the uh, parties in this matter, the victim's family, as well as witnesses, some predictability as to future trial dates and not only that, most importantly, to protect the record and to avoid needless speedy trial litigation down the road. It's an actual issue. You see, ladies and gentlemen, where everybody thought this was going to be a slam dunk case, 
The defense made a simple request. The judge made a decision. And suddenly, it's all a big mess. And if there is a conviction down the road, guess what? Speedy trial. Do you remember when this happened before? Oh, yeah, that's right. Lori Vallow. Remember that. I told you, that's the issue on appeal, speedy trial. So the prosecution went on in their motion to remind the judge that obviously Koberger is charged with four counts of first degree murder and burglary. Um, and that took place on May 16th. And on May 19th, the defendant filed motions requesting the grand jury materials, including the record and all the transcript. In the days that followed, the state and the defense conferred but were unable to reach an agreement as to the scope of the grand jury materials subject to release under the Idaho criminal rules. Then on June 13th, the defendant filed a motion to stay proceedings, arguing that he intends to contest the indictment. Well, that's great if you intend to, but you actually have to be able to make a showing at the time that you make their request. So the court uh, they asked the court then to stay this case so that they could discover and so that they could discover the grounds upon which to do so. Basically, they their motion wasn't ripe yet, but they had to make these arguments early on. But the prosecution also has the obligation to get all this information to the defense in a timely manner so that they can meet these statutory deadlines. So the sole legal basis offered by the defendant in his request was the Idaho Code Section 2-213, which allows a party to request a stay in proceedings where there has been a substantial failure to comply with the applicable law in selecting the grand jury. Then on July 10th, the court issued an order for a limited stay of proceedings, and the court rejected the defendant's rationale that the Idaho code that they cited to applies at this stage of the proceedings. Nevertheless, the court elected to issue the limited stay to toll speedy trial for 37 days, relying upon the good cause language found in Idaho code section 19-19. 3501. And as the court noted in its order for limited stay of proceedings, Koberger and his counsel agreed to the terms of this stay on July 6, 2023, acknowledging that he could not later argue that his right to speedy trial was violated so long as he is brought to trial within six months during the speedy trial period, plus the additional time that was stayed, 37 days. Trial is set to begin October 2nd, which means shouldn't be an issue as of yet. It's on the record. Well, the prosecutor then cites some Supreme Court Idaho State case law that says the court unambiguously rejected the notion that the defendant can partially but not fully waive his right to a speedy trial, explaining that the section at issue does not allow for such a limited waiver. Once the trial has been postponed, the six-month statutory period no longer applies. In this case, the, the prosecution argues that the court issued its order for the stay after the defendant requested the stay under Idaho Code Section 2-213, which as the court noted in its order, staying the time period for speedy trial is a premature request. And instead of issuing a stay under Idaho Code Section 2-213, the court crafted limited stay that served not to halt the proceedings in the traditional sense of stay, but rather to simply extend the period of speedy trial by some 37 days. The prosecution notes that the court left the uh, trial date of October 2nd of 2023. Even though the defendant stated on the record that he didn't intend to waive his speedy trial right, the practical effect of his motion to stay and the court's subsequent order is that the court has issued an order upon the defendant's application the trial may be set outside of his six-month speedy trial period. And it further complicates matters that the defendant has even stipulated to good cause under the very statute that the Idaho Supreme Court has held cannot allow for a limited speedy trial waiver. Whew. So what does that really mean? Okay, let's explain it. Like I said, the court granted a stay of 37 days. The trial date remains the same. So Brian Koberger will get to trial by October 2nd, unless, of course, he unequivocally waives his right to speedy trial. The prosecution saying, hey, judge, we want you to go back and tell Koberger you either waive speedy trial unequivocally without any pressure uh, or undue influence so that you can address these issues. If not, 
we're going to have this trial on October 2nd. If the, if the defense attorneys need more time, they need to waive the speedy trial. And then who knows when this case could be set out into. Now, the prosecution here, though, are they making more issues than they really need to? I think they probably are, but they're trying to protect the record because speedy trial, it doesn't happen very often. But I'm telling you, I think that's going to be the issue in the Lori Vallow trial is the whole speedy trial mess um, that the judge created by setting her trial outside of the time period required. Although the judge hasn't done that here, he's given a little bit of a buffer. Uh, but once again, if the trial takes place on October 2nd, no issue. The prosecution just wants, they want more time. Let's face it. The prosecution wants more time to prepare their case and they want a date certain. The defense is having their cake and eat it too, which is, hey, we need more time, but we don't want to, you know, really need more time. So we're going to try to jam the uh, prosecution by keeping this trial date, which will be tough for them to do. But that's probably the best shot that they have. But in all reality, let's face it, it's a death penalty case. The defense is not going to be ready. So if I was the judge, I'd bring him in and say, let's just clean up the record. Defense, you want a continuance or you want to go to trial? And if you don't want your continuance now, I'm probably not going to be inclined to give it to you on you know, October 1st, the day before trial. So think wisely what you want to do. Problem solved. Now we just need the court to watch Crime Talk. A home in Nevada has had a search warrant executed in regards to the Tupac Shakur's 1996 murder probe and the house is owned by the wife of a former Crips gang member, a guy that goes by the name of Keith D, who previously claimed to know who gunned down the rapper. Now, Dwayne Davis, this guy's like 60 years old, uh, also known as Keith D, is married to Paula Clemens, who owns the house on Maple Shade Street that was raided and where the search warrant was executed on Monday night as part of an investigation as it relates to Tupac Shakur's murder. Now, for those who are not familiar with this, Shakur was 25 when he was killed just one block from the Las Vegas Strip in September of 1996 after leaving the Mike Tyson fight at the MGM Grand Plaza Hotel. His case has remained unsolved now for 27 years. Now, in 2018, while filming the 10-part Netflix docuseries, Unsolved, The Tupac and Biggie Murders, Keith D. claimed it was his own nephew, a guy by the name of Orlando Baby Lane Anderson, who pulled the trigger and said that he was in the car with him at that time. Now, video footage shows the moment a convoy of armored police vehicles rolled down the residential street on the outskirts of Las Vegas to the home where they sought uh, computers, laptops, and articles about Tupac and his death. A neighbor who lives nearby on the same street where the warrant was served Monday night uh, stated that they witnessed police arrive at the property with their guns drawn as they demanded occupants to come out of the home with their hands up. All the occupants apparently complied with the police orders, but it's unclear if any arrests were made or if anything was actually found during the execution of the search warrant. The Las Vegas Police Department would only confirm that a search warrant was served in Henderson, which is basically just south of uh, Las Vegas there on the Strip. It's where the uh, Raiders have their training facility, you got the Henderson Airport. It's right there. Nice little, nice little area. Anyway, um, we also did confirm that it was in regards to the ongoing Tupac Shakur homicide investigation, but they're going to have no further comment. So the police did also confirm that the uh, warrant did involve Keith D, the former Crips gang member, uh, whose wife is Paula Clemens, who is also the owner of the house. Now Clemens also owned a home in Compton, California. Uh, noting that back in uh, 1998, the L.A. County Sheriff's Department reportedly recovered a gun in the backyard of a Compton residence that belonged to the girlfriend of the known Crip gang member who was in Las Vegas the night of Shakur's murder. The case remains unsolved, like I said, for nearly 30 years, but evidence is now being presented to the Las Vegas Grand Jury. Wouldn't you love to see that one go to trial, ladies and gentlemen? West Coast versus East Coast, Biggie versus Tupac. Oh, man. There's a little twist, though. Investigators believe that the gunman is out likely dead, and the current investigation could lead to answers about who else was in the car uh, with the shooter when the shots were fired. 
Uh, like I said, Shakur was uh, gunned down in the in his black BMW idling at a red light on Flamingo Road at Coval Lane on September 7th, 1996. It occurred about 11 p.m. The rapper, like I said, was 25, just left the Mike Tyson fight, and bam, next thing you know, he's dead. He was in the BMW with Suge Knight, the boss of his label, Death Row Records, when the assailant uh, fired at the pair. Now, needless to say, Suge Knight, who's currently serving prison sentence for a, a, a beating slash death people, he, yeah, bad guy. If you've ever seen uh, Straight Outta Compton or know anything about Suge Knight, not a good guy. Anyway, um, Tupac was hit four times, including once in the chest, and he was taken to the uh, University Medical Center there in Nevada and died six days later. Now, in a two-hour documentary back in 2017, those who were by the rapper's bedside as he was dying said the rapper indicated that he knew who the killer was. Tupac's murder remains unsolved, but there are several theories about who may be responsible. One theory is that the shooting was retaliation for a shooting six days earlier in which Tupac's associate, Orlando Baby Lane Anderson, was killed. Another theory is that the shooting was the result of a feud between rival rappers on the East and West Coast, namely Biggie Smalls, who was killed in a drive-by the following year. Another theory is that the shooting was carried out by members of the Crips gang who were rival with Tupac's cohorts, the Bloods. Now, the murder of Tupac was an international story and obviously remains a uh, source of fascination and speculation even today. Some even claim that the rapper is still alive. He's hanging out with Elvis. Uh, there's been countless books and documentaries about the case, and there's even a museum dedicated to Tupac in his hometown of New York City. Well, some good news for the aunt of Tammy Day Bell. The judge has designated her to be the family representative during the sentencing of Lori Vallow. Now, Lori Vallow is obviously scheduled to be uh, sentenced for murdering her two kids, JJ and Ty Lee, as well as being convicted for conspiring to kill uh, Tammy Daybell, who is Chad Daybell's first wife. So uh, Vicki Hoban, that's the aunt, she will be able to make a victim impact statement on behalf of the family of Tammy Daybell. As you may recall, there were some issues where the prosecution hadn't designated who was a family member and who was entitled to stay in the courtroom or to speak on behalf of the family under the Idaho Victims' Rights Act. So good thing to know, only three years later, we finally have somebody uh, designated, and that's uh, Vicki Hoban. Obviously, it'll be interesting to see what she has to say as Lori Vallow gets uh, sentenced um, on July 31st. And then the appeals shall begin. Now, there was also a hearing canceled today as it related to Lori Vallow's husband, Chad Daybell. As we brought you the news, the attorney for Chad Daybell, uh, John Pryor, wanted to get a copy of the transcript from the trial as well as all of the exhibits. A hearing was scheduled and it was abruptly vacated because the prosecution said, yes, you can have a copy of that. Now, normally these are these transcripts are ordered pretty much contemporaneously as they're prepared when you have a co-defendant, particularly if you know you're going to trial. But in this particular case, Mr. Pryor wants the state to share a portion of the expense for the preparation of the transcript. Now, I know in the world of AI, you would think how simple it could be to have a transcript prepared quite easily. Well, it is anything but the case. Let's talk about this. This is the most important person in the courtroom in my estimation, and that's the court reporters. The court reporters have to take down every word and identify who's saying basically have their own language that they create in this shorthand when they use their little stenographer machines. But what most people don't realize is, is that usually by the time a transcript is prepared, that court reporter has listened to that hearing or trial about four times. Maybe court reporters out there can let me know differently, but obviously they heard it once in court. Then they have their rough draft and they usually listen to it again. And then they listen to it again, and then they proofread it. By the time they get done, it's usually been reviewed and listened to at least four times to compare the transcript to what was also being recorded. It is a long process. 
the court reporters usually, even if they're employed by the state, get to keep what it costs to produce the transcripts. It used to be a couple dollars a page. I've seen it as high as $10 per page. And of course, they space it out, really bold letters, um, a lot of spacing in between lines so that they can get that. But frankly, the court reporters deserve it. But those transcripts can start getting expensive. For a trial that went for several weeks, those transcripts could be thirty to $50,000. And I don't think Chad Daybell has that kind of money just laying around. If he did, he, you know, no wonder why Mr. Pryor wants to get a copy for at least free or maybe at a reduced expense, no doubt. Please go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up for a background subscription service. You'll be happy you did. If there's anyone out there you were ever curious about, what was in their background, now is the time to do it. If you're going to get involved with somebody, now is the time to do it. When you go to crimetalksearch.com, you put in the name, literally millions of public records are searched and a report is generated. And it's going to give you a report. If they have multiple social media accounts, you're going to find it. If they have multiple phone numbers, multiple email addresses, it's going to be found. And more importantly, you're going to get information regarding criminal history. Hopefully the person you're searching has none whatsoever, but if it's there, it's going to be found. You're going to get everything you'd want to know, whether you're going into business or whether you're going into a personal relationship, you're going to be able to find out the information you want to know. So go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up today. You'll be happy you did. Yes, imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. That's what the BTK serial killer Dennis Rader is saying. Now, Dennis Rader was arrested in 2005 after killing 10 people in Kansas and claims that the accused Long Island serial killer Rex Hewerman is nothing more than a cheap copycat. After hearing details surrounding the Gilgo Beach murders, that's right, he took to pen and paper to claim his superiority. In an interview, Rader s said he spotted numerous similarities between himself and Hewerman, who was arrested in Manhattan on July 13th for the deaths of only three women found at the Long Island Gilgo Beach in 2010. Hewerman, a 59-year-old married architect with two children, had been living unnoticed in the Massapequa Park home near the former Nassau County Police Academy while commuting to Manhattan for work. That's right, the BTK guy, Raider, says, I was arrested at age 59. Notice the coincidence? Married, two kids. Coincidence? Uh, not according to BT BTK. And the husband, dad, and a longtime serial killer stalker used electronic devices, lives in a neighborhood undetected. That's right, in 2005, the police arrested uh, Raider years after he eluded and taunted investigators and the media. His trail of digital evidence is what eventually helped police capture him. He then nicknamed himself BTK, which stood for Bind torture, and kill. Mr. Hewerman, an alleged copycat, as you know, has been suspected and charged in the death of three women found on the Long Island beach over a decade ago. And he's believed to possibly killed at least one victim at his home there in Massapequa Park, according to law enforcement. Now, it's unclear which victim the investigators believe was murdered in Hewerman's residence, but it's also suspected that his wife and two children were away from the home when this alleged killing took place. As we've noted previously, Hewerman is charged with the death of three of the four women known collectively as the Gilgo Four. The bodies were found within days of each other on Gilgo Beach back in December of 2010. All four women were buried in burlap sacks. Take that, BTK. Hewerman was uh, been charged with six counts of murder in the deaths of Melissa Bartholomew. Megan Waterman and Amber Lim Costello, and is the prime suspect in the death of Maureen Brainerd Barnes. Now, I'm just going to bring this out. If you've been a fan here for a while and watched, we've talked about the 12 undeniable truths of life from a criminal defense attorney. Yes, and what is one of those undeniable truths? That's right. Everybody has a second life. And usually those second lives get exposed when things like this come about, you know, getting charged for being a serial killer. But it just throws that out there. From my experiences doing criminal defense, 
usually when people get in trouble, they're doing something that they're not telling everybody else about, that they have a second life, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I'm not saying if you got a second life, maybe sure you didn't tell your spouse that maybe you stashed away a little extra uh, money for a Christmas uh, fund or something along those lines. That's not a double life. But you know, if you're out doing things you probably shouldn't be doing and you don't want to tell your spouse about, I think that qualifies as a double life. And so we can see Rex Heuerman, Raider, double life. (laughs) 